You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Let me take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16, as we continue in our study looking at the life of Abraham, thinking on the faith of Abraham as we prepare uh, to go into a study in the book of Romans come the fall. Today, though, we read about the actions that Sarai and Abram took to bring along God's promises to them. And these things that they did that brought about the birth of Abram's son Ishmael through Sarai's Egyptian servant, Hanagon. Again, this was Sarai's plan, and Abram went along with it, again, to bring about God's promises in their own efforts, in what they did, through natural means. And such natural works, works of the flesh, is not how God has planned to bring about his promises. They won't succeed. And on this thought, in Galatians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul takes this idea of Ishmael being born out of efforts of the flesh, and he uses it to illustrate and show that God's blessing does not come from our own efforts and our own works in of ourselves. As we try to make ourselves something, try to do the work that God has said he alone would do, you see, in the book of Galatians, uh, those believers there in the city of Galatia had been led astray by false teachers that taught that, yes, you needed Jesus, but you also needed to be circumcised. You needed to become Jewish in order to be saved. Even further, sanctification. Don't get me wrong, sanctification does not happen apart from our obedience, but nonetheless, it is not by looking to our own flesh and looking to our own works and, and mustering our own strength uh, to keep the external commands of the old covenant, saying, I'm going to obey and I'm going to do it. But that's not how it works. That's not the process of sanctification. But it is looking to Christ. It is trusting in Him. It is loving him and responding to what he has done for us and his love for us. That we are changed not from external things to inside, but that we are changed from the inside out. So the Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 4, verses 22 to 23. He said, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. So the son of the free woman, the free woman being Sarah, and her son Isaac. The slave woman is Hagar, and her son Ishmael. Efforts of the flesh does not accomplish the work of God. It's something we have to learn. It's something Sarah and Abram had to learn. As we see in our text here this morning, that they worked to fulfill God's promise themselves. God was not working on their timeline. And so they ran out of patience and did what they could to bring about God's promise. But if anything of God's work was accomplished by our own efforts, even just a little bit, then we would be able to take some credit for it. We'd be able to pat ourselves on the back and say, hey, look what I did. I, I did it. And that would give us some of the glory. But God will not share his glory. And so all the work is the work of God that he would receive all the honor. And all the glory. So last time, uh, we saw that pivotal passage where God actually entered into a covenant relationship with Abram. And all this time, we've seen God had promised Abram land, seed, and blessing, and Abram believed. And we saw that 
he believed in his actions and things he did. And so, for example, uh, he did not take the spoils of battle from the king of Sodom. Instead, he trusted in God's provision for him, and he thought that God would receive all the honor and all the glory. And so in response to this, then we saw God assured Abram that he would be his protection and he would be his great reward providing for Abram. And it's then that we see what was on Abram's heart as far as God's provision was concerned. And it was that God would provide for his promise. And so Abram believing yet still struggling, right? Because, because Abram's faith needed to grow and mature, just like all of our faith needs to grow and mature. Abram, believing and struggling, asked, Oh, Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And sovereign Yahweh then assured Abram that he would have an heir, a son of his very own, and that his offspring would be as uncountable as the stars in the sky. And that's then when we read that pivotal verse, that central verse there in chapter 15, verse 6, where it says, He believed the Lord, And he counted it to him as righteousness. And we said, it's not that he just believed there and God credited it to him as righteousness, but that this was the blatant statement to the response of God's promises that Abram had had this whole time. As we've seen again in what Abram did. And then in response to Abram's question of how he would know that he would inherit the land, God made his covenant with Abram, a covenant that was dependent on God alone. And now as we pick up the text after this declaration of Abram's faith and God entering into a covenant relationship with him, again, we continue to see the need for Abram's faith to grow and mature. But this time it's not just Abram, it's Sarai as well. Again, this is another pivotal passage in the life of Abraham, and in the promise of the seed. Again, God is not on, or I should say, Sarai and Abram are not on God's timeline. And so they think they need to help God along. And whenever we think we need to help God along, that is the making of disaster. And so let's read our passage here for this morning. Again, Genesis 16, starting here in verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord, who spoke to her, you are a God of seeing. For she said, I truly, I hear I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Bir Lahajroi. It it lies between Kadesh and Barad. And Hagar bore Abram a son 
And Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Now, as we, we dig into this passage, we see that Sarai's barrenness continues to appear as a threat, at least to Abram and Sarai. And so again, we see there in verse 1, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And this continues to be viewed as a threat to the promise God gave, even after God has assured Abram that he would have a son of his own. Now, behind this text was an ancient Near East practice that uh, is attested in different writings that have been found, uh, of when a wife was not able to bear children for her husband, that husband would be given another woman as his concubine by which they may have children through. And so we see that Sarah, she had a slave, and it says that she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. Now we've already mentioned about this Egyptian servant when Abram came up out of Egypt after going there to escape the famine. And we said that his, the consequences of Abram at that time taking matters into his own hands, going into Egypt and, and lying about Sarai being only his sister, uh, we would see the reverberation of those consequences, and, and here we are now. As the text here repeats that Hagar was an Egyptian. And so we have to ask, how did this Egyptian become a servant in Abram's household? Well, it's only reasonable to see that she would have been one of those servants, one of those slaves that Pharaoh gave to Abram as uh, payment for Sarai when he took Sarai into his harem. And remember, too, that despite how things turned out, that God protected Sarai and through plagues in Pharaoh's house caused Pharaoh to give Sarai back to Abram unharmed, Abram still was able to keep everything Pharaoh gave him. And so we see this Egyptian slave in their household. And at this point, this slave, Hagar, had been given to Sarai as her own maidservant. Now, the promise of a child at this point is over 10 years old. We know this because we're told in the text that it had been 10 years since they settled in Canaan. Moses told us when he said about when Abram had left Haran, he said that Abram was 75 years old. And so we said then that would mean that Sarai at that point was about 65 years old. And so 10 years later, Abram would now be then 85 years old. And so Sarai would be about 75 years old. And so as we think on these things, we shouldn't be too harsh in our thinking towards Sarai and Abram as we see they grow impatient and they grow weary about the promise. As when the promise was made, Sarai was already past childbearing years and her and Abram are only getting older. And so now, 10 years later, they're still without a child. And think about it. How patient are you and I when things don't go according to our timeline? When things don't go the way we would expect them to go. And that could be either in our individual lives or that could be as a church as well. You know, shouldn't we be seeing this already? Or shouldn't this be happening in my life? Or, or shouldn't this be done with by now? And, or whatever it may be. And we may have different expectations for different reasons. When it comes to the church. I think the church growth movement with books like Purpose Driven Church, Come Back Church, and guys like Rick Warren, Ed Stetzer, and Bill Hybels have put timelines and expectations for growth that frankly are not scriptural. Or maybe in our personal lives, we have had thoughts that maybe a relationship that had been broken would be reconciled by now. Or maybe in my job, maybe I would have gotten that raise or that promotion by now. Or maybe just in general, where I'm at in my life, I thought I'd be further along by the time I reached this age. Or I thought it'd be somewhere different in my life. But whatever it may be, we've had our expectations according to our timeline. 
But how often is our timeline God's timeline? How often is, do our plans line up with God's plans? We tend to lose patience. But we need to recognize and realize God's timing is right. And God's ways, even when they're not our ways, God's ways are always right. And so can we submit when it's clear that God's not on our timeline? And can we submit when it's clear that our plans may not be God's plans and that what we expect may not even be God's will for our lives? Even in all that, can we trust him and trust that his ways and his timing is always right and always good? Sarai struggled with that, clearly. And so we see there in verse 2. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Now, let's just note a few things here. First, look again at what Sarai says. Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Uh, Some say that she means this as a complaint against God. Or maybe she's just stating the facts. In any case, she is saying what is true. It is God who opens and closes the womb. It is God who has decided who would be born and when they'd be born. It is God who is in complete control over all things without exception. Life and death are in his hands. He is the creator of all things, and so he has all rights over all things, including life and death, including when someone would be born, if someone would be pregnant, including how one's life, how long one's life will be, and what will be the ends. So once again, as we talk about this, we must mention God's purposes. Whatever the circumstances in life, whatever the circumstances in death. God is working out his purposes for his glory. Even in whether or not someone can have as many children as they desire to have or whether someone is unable to have children or whatever the circumstances may be. He is working out his purposes and his purposes are always right and always good. Even when they hurt even when we don't understand. His purposes are always right and good because he is righteous and he is good in all he does. Also, Sarai's plan here, again, is for Abram to have children with her servant. You know, we've talked about interpreting narratives. Uh, And even just recently, uh, when we were going through hermeneutics, learning how to study the Bible for ourselves on Wednesday nights. Uh, We talked about how narratives do not always tell us the moral right and wrong of something that took place. At times they do, like with David's affair with Bathsheba. It tells us the moral wrongness of, of that. But it doesn't always. Sometimes it just tells us something happened or something was done without expressing the moral implications of a thing. Because that's not necessarily the point of the text. So we need to look to God's law or to the epistles to determine the morality of something according to God's standard. And as we look at this passage here, we might think that's the case because there is no explicit statement about the moral right or wrong about Sarah's plan here in giving Hagar to Abram that she may bear them a son. But I would argue that both in the larger and in the immediate context, it is very clear that this was actually an evil thing. And it was outside of God's intentions for marriage. One, this is the book of Genesis. And right at the beginning of this book, God created the marriage union. And he established it in the garden between Adam and Eve. Not Adam and Eve and Edna. Marriage is between one man and one woman. That's God's design. Also, we see in our passage for this morning uh, the destruction that comes with Abram and Sarai going outside of God's ordained design for marriage. 
And two, we see that although Sarai gives her servant to Abram to have an heir, the child that that servant bears is not the child of promise. God was only going to fulfill his promise through Sarai. She was his wife from the start. God would not fulfill this promise through Hagar. But now, I already said that that there is evidence of this being a, a practice there in the ancient Near East. So, it's clear then that this was culturally and legally acceptable at that time. But just because it was culturally and legally acceptable doesn't mean it was right. There are many things that are legal, that are still immoral, and that the majority of people would get behind. And that doesn't make it okay. Abortion today is culturally and legally acceptable. That doesn't make it any less murder. And so just because our government and the majority of people want to celebrate it as empowering women, that doesn't mean it does empower women. If there was any kind of twisting, satanic twisting of truth, that's it. Something can be both legal and still be wicked. Something can be encouraged by the culture and still be demonic. So Abram and Sarai took matters into their own hands here. Doing, yes, what was culturally acceptable, but was still wrong. Now, you'd think Abram would have learned what happens when you take matters into your own hands, right? You'd think he would have learned when he went down to Egypt to escape the famine, when he lied about Sarai being just his sister. You'd think he'd learn. But again, we should not be so quick to be so harsh against Abram, because I'm sure, I have no doubt, that at least many of you, if not all of you, would be like me, who has to think about the fact, how, how slow am I? And have I been to learn? How many times have I had to fail time and time again and again and again before I would learn? And even then, I still had a ways to go. And so, again, we see that they they follow through with this plan. Sarai gives Abram, her servant Hagar, And verse 4 says, And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. So now where Hagar was given by Sarai to Abram as a concubine, and and a concubine is a, a wife of lesser status in a household practicing polygamy, as Hagar was given to Abram by Sarah, Sarah, still the primary wife, yet she's barren. And so it's possible here that Hagar, being able to have children, that that could have caused her to look down on Sarai, thinking that her status in the household should be bumped up. Because she can have children. Or maybe Sarai, or maybe Hagar was thinking. You, Sarai, you're barren, so clearly God has cursed you, because that was the thinking of the day. Clearly God had not. God was just fulfilling his plan in his time. But the common thought of the day was that this person must be cursed. So she may be thinking, you're cursed, yet I can have children, so clearly I'm blessed. And so in some way, whatever it may have been, she she began to think she was better than Sarai. And so pride has risen up in Hagar in all of this. And she looks on Sarai with contempt or by despising her. And so there's this pride and there's this jealousy between Sarai and Hagar. And so this broke their relationship. And we have to get it. We have to understand. We we can't be slow to learn. Sin is destructive. Sin does great harm. It is deadly. We have to understand. And if we notice with all of this, what was the source of temptation uh, to not just come up with this plan, but follow through with it? 
It was doubt. Uh, They doubted God would provide, so they thought to provide for themselves. They believed something wrongly about God, that he wouldn't come through. And whenever any of us falls into sin, it is because we are believing something wrongly about God. We're not trusting him for what he says is best or what he says he will do. We have doubts. And when we have different struggles and and when, again, God's not on our timeline, uh, that can bring those, those doubts and those fears. And there can be struggles and, and different struggles in our lives uh, can develop into wrong ideas about God. Abram and Sarai had a struggle in their marriage. They were childless. Both of them have already recognized God's sovereignty over their situation, and yet they have failed to trust God's ways are best. They failed to trust God would provide, and so they reasoned with themselves that they could provide for themselves. So my friends, when you're struggling, when your situation is not as you wish it could be, the question that you need to ask yourself is, can you trust God? Can you trust in his promises? Can you trust in his provision? Can you trust that he will do what he has said he will do? Maybe you have a struggle in your marriage. Maybe it's not childlessness. Maybe for some it is. Maybe for some, the problem isn't in your marriage because you're not married yet. Maybe your struggle is is being single. Or something else, that there may be conflict in your life or in your marriage. Instead of taking matters into your own hands, can you trust God's sovereign will and his timing and not, therefore, go outside of God's design and God's plan and his revealed moral will? And that includes for our marriage. How has God designed marriage to be? Can we trust his purposes and that his purposes are always right? And so when temptation rises... When we want to take matters into our own hands and go outside of God's revealed will, can we instead trust God's ways are best and say no to that temptation? It's actually some of the things we were talking about with the kids during VBS, right? We talked about the the, the armor of God, right? And and what the shield of faith is, faith believing God's word. And so that that shield deflecting the arrows of the lies and temptations that come flying at us from the devil in the world. Can we trust God? Can we truly believe what he has said? Not take matters into our own hands, but know God provides. Now, don't get me wrong as I say this. I am not suggesting that in our Christian life, we sit on the sidelines and we're never proactive in our living out of our lives, that that we are just passive and waiting for God to unfold his plan. And we never move until we know every detail of God's plan. I'm not saying that. I mean, too, how often does God reveal every detail of his plan? We would say, that'd be nice, but God's saying, no, I have my purposes for not. And he usually doesn't. And and for Abram here, he, he didn't reveal all the details of his plan. But the problem is when we do not consider what God has revealed when we're making decisions, when we're about to move, We don't consider what he has revealed as his moral will when it comes to the church. And we're not seeing the things that we wish we see. Do we we consider how God has ordered his church and how he has planned for what he has planned for his church is revealed in his word? When it comes to the workplace, have, have we considered God's standard of what is work ethic? Have we considered God's standard of commitments and dealing with our relationships? When we go outside of his will to take matters into our own hands to force something, that's the issue we're talking about here. That's the problem. That's what Abram and Sarai did. 
They went outside of God's revealed will for their marriage in order to force something that God had not done yet. Marriage is God's design. We are God's creation. He made us, and we belong to him. That's Psalm 100. And so God has every right over our lives to tell us how to live. And he has every right over marriage to define marriage as he determines to. And what he says is to be the practice of marriage. He has the right to make such declarations. And I know that the world scoffs at that, but that doesn't make it any less true. Whenever we step outside of God's design for marriage between one man and one woman, it is destructive. And that's what we see here. We see that destruction. Look at verse 5. It says, And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. Now, we might read this and say, whoa, 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 time out, tasty cake break. What, Sarai? Are you, are you really saying this is all Abram's fault? Uh, I mean, wasn't this your plan? D- didn't you initiate this whole thing? I mean, didn't you even just say right here that you gave your servant into Abram's embrace? And you're saying this is all his fault? I mean, come on, Sarai. But listen, from the start of this, in the making of this plan, in both Abram and her following through with this plan, what do we see? But pride. It's pride to think that we can bring about what God has said he will do. And what does pride do? It blinds us to our own sin. And pride and sin causes us very often to pass the blame, right? And parents know this with their children, or I think all of us too could probably just think of ourselves when we were kids, right? And that there were times when we got in trouble for something, and what did we try to do? Come up with excuses why we were in the wrong, or blame somebody else, and say, why, it's, it's not my fault. And what is that? It's the demonstration of the hardness of heart that sin brings about. And she says, may the Lord judge between you and me, but the Lord's judgment between the two of them will not cause her to come out free and clean. At the same time, Abram went along with Sarai. And truth be told, he would be held accountable for the condition of his home. We read there in verse 2. Again, it says, Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. Uh, Abram should have been the voice of reason to her voice of doubt. But instead, Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. And nearly everyone I read concerning this pointed out that this reflects what we see in the Garden of Eden after Eve had been deceived into eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and so had led her husband to eat from it as well. And when God was laying out the consequences for their sin, we see in chapter 3, verse 17, it says, And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, see that? You have listened to the voice of your wife. What did Abram do? He listened to the voice of Sarai. Again, to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Curse is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And on we see, too, we can keep going in that passage. Adam was to lead and protect his wife. But instead... He willfully followed her, though she was deceived. He followed her into her deception, followed her willingly into sin. He should have led and protected her. 
And Abram, what was he to do? He should have led and protected his wife. But instead, he listened to the voice of Sarah. Husbands, we are accountable to how we lead our homes. We are accountable for the condition of our homes. We are to lead and protect according to godliness. That's what we must do. We're not to be passing the buck. We're not to be passive or lazy. We men will give an account before God for how we lead our homes. And Abram here, he's very passive. And even as Sarai brings this complaint against him, brings this blame on him, how does he respond passively? We see there in verse 6, he says, listen, she's your slave. Do with her as you want. Which again shows too that, at least in Abram's mind, the status of Hagar never really changed. In some sense, she's still just a slave in the household. And so we see then as a result of Abram's lack of leadership in his home, Sarai mistreats Hagar so badly that she runs away. And so then we see this continue here in verse 7. It says, The angel of the Lord, or the angel of Yahweh, found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way or on the road to Shur. Now, this is an important verse uh, because this is the first time that we see the mention of the angel of the Lord or the angel of Yahweh. And there's a question, okay, who is the angel of Yahweh? And we can see that in the different passages that he's found in in the Old Testament, he, he talks as though he's separate from God, and yet he speaks as God. And Hagar here, along with others who encounter him in the Old Testament, speak to the angel of Yahweh and recognize him as Yahweh. He's equated with God in some passages, and yet in other passages he's distinct from God. Also, many note that you do not see the angel of Yahweh in the New Testament after Christ is born. And so I would argue, along with many others, that what we have here as the angel of Yahweh is the pre-incarnated Christ. That he is God, and yet at the same time he is distinct from God. Because he is the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ. He's manifested for people to see. And so, as we, we see in these verses, verses 7 through 12, the angel of Yahweh instructs and reassures Hagar. If the Lord met her on the road to Shur, it's likely that she was trying to get back to Egypt, back to her home. Uh, Shur is on the southwest border of Canaan and on the northeast border of Egypt. And verse 8 says, And he said to her, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And he asks her this question, not so he can find out information about her. He already knows all about her. I mean... He's the Lord, right? But like in the garden with Adam and Eve, after Adam and Eve sinned and they hid from God, and God, as he walked through the garden, he said, where are you and and have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to? He doesn't ask those questions because he doesn't know, but because he was drawing out from Adam and Eve something. Specifically there, he was drawing out confession and repentance. Here he is drawing out of Hagar, a realization of the true nature of her situation so she can respond appropriately. And we see here Hagar's response. She tells him that she's fleeing from Sarai, her mistress. And then we see the Lord's response to that, the angel of the Lord's response to that. And his response may be tough in our our modern reading, but nonetheless, what he says there in verse 9 is, return to your mistress and submit to her. Hagar was not an innocent party in this situation. Though Sarai also should not have mistreated her as she did. But Hagar was to go back and submit to Sarai. 
and the Lord has determined to provide for Hagar in her distress, that her offspring through Abram will be multiplied beyond being able to count. And so it sounds much like God's promise to Abram. And so her son is to be called Ishmael, which means God hears. And he's to be called this because as we see at the end of verse 11, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. And this is how he has responded. He has provided for her. He's instructed her. He has, he has told her of this blessing. Naming him Ishmael, that God hears, would also be a reminder to Abram and Sarai. Listen, you have doubts? You have fears? Cry out to God. He hears. He hears. Now, there is a distinction between what we see here in God's promise to Hagar and the promise that God makes to Abram. And the distinction is, the distinction is instead of blessings to all nations, instead there's conflict. Verse 12 says, he shall be a wild donkey of a man, which is the idea that he will be stubborn, he'll be a loner, he'll be fierce and aggressive. It says his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. And as you look at Ishmael and you look at his descendants and the nations that came from Ishmael, that's exactly what happened. Matter of fact, we see this even right up to our own very day. Just think of the conflict that has been in the Middle East throughout the centuries with wars between the Arabic nations and those nations set against Israel. I mean... This is the very source of the Middle East crisis, right there. Do you think that Abram and Sarai could have in any way realized the depth and the lasting effects that their doubts and sins would have had? Thousands of years later? It's a lesson for us to learn. We have no idea what the ripple effect of our choices and our sin will be. And I'm not even saying it will be as deep as the Middle East crisis or as long-lasting as, as this is. But nonetheless, we are fools when we justify our sin by saying, I'm not, I'm not hurting anybody. You know, it's, just, it's just me. I'm not, I'm not affecting anyone else. We can't know the effects of our choices and our sins. We need to think about that. Think about how our life is not to be lived for ourselves, but live for the glory and honor of our God. And then we see here, Hagar speaks to the angel of Yahweh as being Yahweh, and she calls God, you are the God who sees me. This is what she calls him. This is the name that she has for him. At least that's one way of translating it. I think that's how the, the NIV has it translated. And, and if that's correct, then this would refer to God as one who cares for her. He saw her, and he cared for her, giving her this promise and, and telling her to return to Sarai. But it could also be, as we read here in the English Standard Version, you are a God of seeing. And that would refer to God as, as being one who is seen. Uh, as as God shows himself, as he manifests himself. And it's hard to know which one to go with. And now you think, well, here in the text, it gives us reasons why she calls him this, right? And you see there in verse 13, it says, Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. All right, so maybe he's a God of seeing, right? Maybe. Uh, or verse 14 says, Therefore, the well was called, so in response to this, the well was called Bir Lahai Roy, and it lies between Kadesh and Barad. Bir Lahai Roy means the well of the living one who sees me. Again, in, in, in any case, though, she clearly recognized that this God is not like the gods she knew down in Egypt. The gods 
with eyes that cannot see and hands that can do nothing. This is not a God that is fashioned by men, men out of stone and gold. But this is the God who shows himself to be true and actually works and actually does what he says he will do. And then we read there in verses 15 through 16. It says, And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. So obviously then, Hagar did go back and submit to Sarai, and I think the evidence of that is the fact that Abram knew what to call his son. He knew to name him Ishmael. And then we're told Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. And so first we saw 10 years had passed when Sarai ran out of patience and devised this plan, but now another year has passed. And in all of this, we see what happens when we trust not in the Lord, but in our own reasoning and our own know-how. Abram believed God would fulfill his promise, but, but God was on a different timetable than Sarai and Abram. And so they thought they could help God along. We should never think we could help God along. That's just pride. Any efforts in of ourselves will always be devastating. And we need to think that in so many areas and understand it. God is going to do what God said he will do. It's up to God. We need to trust him. And so even just last week, as we discussed that salvation is by grace alone through faith, and that faith is recognizing that our salvation is by God through his grace alone, that it's nothing on our part. It's all that he has done to bring about salvation. Any effort in of ourselves to try and add to what God has done or any effort in ourselves to accomplish our own salvation is not only just unwise and fruitless, it's damning. Or even too, when it comes to the church, we have our expectations. We assume we know what God is doing. And so if we don't see what we think we should be seeing, well, I guess God's just not working. And when things aren't according to our timeline, we we assume something's wrong. And so then we're tempted to resort to all kind of man-made efforts to grow the church, to preach shorter and shallow sermons, to not preach the word of God at all, but instead show movies and explain the movies and how they apply to our lives. We avoid speaking of sin and wrath and and avoid passages of scripture that, that might be offensive to our culture. Again, we've been saying we're going to get into the book of Romans here in the fall. But maybe we should just get right into Romans chapter 2. Maybe we should skip chapter 1 altogether because what Paul says there in chapter 1, that's not very PC. Someone might be offended. Maybe we shouldn't just avoid that because we want to bring people in. We, We want to grow. We want to see God really working. But really, that's not God working. That's us working in our own flesh. That's, that's us trusting what we can do in our own wisdom, not trusting God. We need to trust God and trust him to even our own evangelistic efforts. Not feel that we need to be successful and, and see people make a decision. When we think that way, we appeal to people's emotions and and we avoid what's offensive. We just say, God loves you and Jesus died for you. But we never tell of why Jesus really had to die. We give the remedy without the diagnosis. And so when people come to Christ, they come for all kinds of reasons. They come for a better life. They come to find purpose. But they do not come for what they need from Jesus. And what they need from Jesus is righteousness. We have no righteousness in ourselves. Jesus is our righteousness. That's why we must come to him. We need to preach the word. We need to warn of sin and judgment. We need to give the understanding of the utter sinfulness of sin. We need to give the plight that all mankind has before a holy God and proclaim Christ and Christ crucified, calling others to repentance and faith. Our salvation 
our church, our evangelistic efforts are not in our efforts. Yes, we are God's instruments, and he has called us to be obedient. But we don't trust in us. We trust in him. I think what what S. Lewis Johnson said uh, hits the nail on the head. He said, we preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are convinced that the Holy Spirit brings men to Christ. There is hardly an evangelist traveling around the country who would not agree to that statement that it is God who saves souls. But oh, how we have developed all kinds of human means in order to expedite the decision-making process. And so we have long, lengthy, emotional appeals. We have appeals to raise hands in meetings, and we have appeals to come down front, and we have appeals to pray through, and we have appeals to sign decision cards. Evangelism is conducted as if God saves, and we also are the ones who bring them to Christ in that secondary sense. We are not willing, really, to practice what we preach. That is, that God saves men through his word. We are not willing to preach his word and allow the Holy Spirit to bring men to Christ. No, it becomes about what we do, that we have to say the right thing, that we have to be attractive. Not saying, no, it's what God does. God called us to be his mouthpiece. we got to proclaim the message he's given us to proclaim and trust him to do the work. We don't try to help God along in our own efforts. We did, and we were successful. We could say, look at what I did. Look, I can take some of the credit for that. But I can't take any of the credit. All the credit goes to God. He alone deserves the honor and glory. Even as Sarah and Abram, in their efforts, their plans to bring about God's desired end, they could say, hey, look, we helped God out. But no, they won't be able to because Ishmael did not receive, was not the child of promise. He was a child of the efforts of the flesh. God was not going to pass the promise on through Ishmael, but through the one that would be born of Sarai in God's timing, in God's way. My friends, let us put off any effort of our own. Let us obediently trust our God and know that he will do the work and that it is all, all of the work, not for our glory, but for his honor and his glory. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visit nvbc.com.